Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for this opportunity to come together and feast together on your word. We are so aware of, of our limitations of just how much we don't know. It is my prayer that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish and of the flesh and, and is not of sound reason that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, and welcome to BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, this is Sunday. Uh, we're studying together through 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at around verse 11 of chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Our main topic of discussion has been uh, the ministry of reconciliation, that is the context. Uh, we were told, number one, that when we proclaim the truth, we don't need to couch it in phrases that include guile or deceit. Uh, we don't need to use bait, uh, but we are simply commanded to declare the truth of the Word of God. Uh, we don't need to use gimmicks because God has commanded light to shine in some hearts and in other hearts. Uh, well, other hearts are darkened and they will not be reached regardless of the gimmick and, and those in which God has commanded light to shine will hear truth regardless of the stupidity in which it's presented. And I, uh, here at Blessed Hope Forever, I count a lot on that. Therefore, we simply faithfully proclaim the Word of God, uh, the Word as it is written. Uh, that word, as we found out, was in fact the proclamation of what God had been doing. Uh, what had He really done from the time that He created the heavens and the earth? He was reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing men's trespasses against them. And uh, moreover, God has committed unto us, the church, the body of Christ, the ministry of this reconciliation. And I suggested to you at the end of the fifth chapter that the end of the fifth chapter uh, does not end with the idea of an incomplete work of God. Uh, that the reconciliation He completed in Christ, He completed once and for all, it's not to be repeated. Uh, that it's not a process that He's still executing today, but one which was in fact uh, finished in Christ when He cried out, it is finished. And then He committed unto us this wonderful ministry of this reconciliation. And so our ministry is not that you ought to do this, that, or the other thing to become reconciled. Our ministry is that God has reconciled you in Christ. And what happens when that is proclaimed? If, it, if, it's, a, if it's a heart in which God has commanded light to shine, it'll shine. If it's a darkened heart in which He has not commanded light to shine, then no amount of deceit or trickery or anything else will cause the light to shine. So we shouldn't then receive this grace of God in vain in a temporary or a casual way. That's talking to Christians, and it's not losing your salvation. So beginning the sixth chapter, knowing then that this was in fact the purpose of God in all creation, God's purpose in all of His program was this reconciliation. The exhortation at the beginning of the sixth chapter becomes particularly important when we realize that most people, most of God's people, receive that reconciliation casually. They receive the grace of God 
in vain. We are more concerned oftentimes with the things of this life, our own personal satisfaction and happiness. Uh, the work of God is almost incidental in most Christian lives. Uh, this grace should not be received casually. We then were given by the Holy Spirit a glimpse into our personal life with the gospel of Jesus Christ, our, our personal relationship with Him, and now our personal relationship with one another. And that uh, centered in the ministry of reconciliation. And then that brought us to, I believe, verse 10, and now we have, uh, uh, well, let's just say that we haven't departed from this central theme of the ministry of reconciliation. At verse 11, as though, as though this is some sanctified uh, portion of Scripture that we can rip out and build a whole denomination on. We are still talking about the ministry of reconciliation. I really can't say that enough. And that ministry is personal. It involves a relationship between God's child and God himself. And so verses 11 and 12 point out that as far as the Holy Spirit of God is concerned, uh, I mean, sure, sure I could spend uh, most of my time preaching about Paul. You know, Paul wrote this. You know, this is Paul's logic. This is Paul's theory. This is what Paul is trying to say. You know, as far as I'm concerned, Paul is, well, he's nothing. Uh, this was written by God Almighty. The author is the Holy Spirit. The writer is the, the beloved Paul. And what we are concerned about is not the logic of Paul or the beauty of, of his command of the Greek language or anything else, but the revelation given by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says from, from God's standpoint, there has been no restraint in the ministry of this reconciliation and there shouldn't be any on their part, the Corinthians part. Uh, but there is, uh, is not one Christian in a hundred willing to faithfully and honestly proclaim what God has done in Christ. You know, we've, we've got it worked out more on the pagan side because it sounds so much more I guess, you know, logical. You know, the, the pagan idea. The, the pagan idea is if, if you will do something, if you will open your heart, if you will obey, if you will surrender, if you will whatever, then the gods will shine on you and, and we'll get just the right amount of rain and just the right amount of sun and, and the crops will be, you know, knee high and and then, you know, by the 4th of July or whatever and everything will work out fine. And, and if it doesn't work that way, well, well, then the gods are angry, you know, and you just need to do something. Now, folks, we know that that's pagan philosophy. But the shame is, is that we bring it into Christian thinking and into Christianity. You know, that man must make the first move. You know, God stands ready to receive you, but you must make the first move. A, a concept, a human concept, which I strongly suggest to you, is nowhere, nowhere, nowhere to be found in the Bible. The world religious system based on human merit loves telling me that God never overrules man's will, yet nobody can find a verse that would show me that. You know, I can find you many verses that illustrate clearly that God overruled every one of His, ser of his servants' wills. He overruled Moses' will. He overruled Paul's will and my will, uh, Abraham's will, uh, Noah's will, your will. Now, now, what the Holy Spirit is saying here is, look, there's no constraint at all with God. God's telling you exactly what He did. He redeemed you, and you didn't ask for it. He reconciled you, and you weren't looking for it. He calls you His own people when you didn't want Him to call you His own people. 
and he led you away from Egypt when you wanted to stay. Folks, that's what he's done. I'm going to tell you about it because he's already done it. It's not something that he's going to do if you somehow do something. Now, since it's something that he's done, now it'd be super nice if, if there weren't any constraint on your part in that ministry of reconciliation. Our heart is totally open to you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking. Your heart is not totally open to this truth, but it should be, is what Paul is saying. Folks, I'm going to tell you very bluntly, be not yoked together in a strange yoke. You have it translated, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yoked, that has to do with working. Okay, can we, can we just understand that? First of all, the Lord said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He didn't say that there is no yoke. Nor did he say that there is no burden. What he said was that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And the more one walks with the Lord, the, the more one realizes that there is a yoke and, and, there, and that there is a burden. Uh, you know, there's a joy unspeakable, a peace that passes understanding, that just wells up within the deeper sense of the Christian. That in fact, the yoke is easy and, and that burden is light. God would not allow the Israelites under the law to yoke a donkey and an and a ox together because it would, well, just ultimately just break them both down. And it wouldn't accomplish the task at hand. I'm trying to make the point that to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers is to not be yoked, that is working together, laboring together, together with those who are unbelievers in the body of Christ, not unbelievers outside the body of Christ. The context is the church, okay? They, the most carnal Christians, were commanded not to be yoked together with the unbelieving of their own kind in, in the body of Christ. And, and many of the Corinthians were not being faithful when it came to this ministry of reconciliation. The popular view today would suggest that we not be yoked together with uh, Corinthian carnality when it's the carnal Christians at Corinth who were commanded not to be unequally yoked with the unbelieving. The text says God's heart was enlarged toward them, these Corinthians. And... and, and Remember, these, this, is the most, this was the most carnal group of Christians in the New Testament. The unbelieving that the Corinthians were commanded, you know, look, the Corinthians were commanded not to labor with these unbelieving ones, okay? These were Corinthians, and yet God calls them righteous. God calls them light. Read the text. His people... His people, God calls them the temple of the living God. The most carnal group of believers on earth, the most carnal group enumerated in the New Testament. Absolutely, His heart toward them was no different than His heart was toward His people when He was in the, the flesh. So who are the unbelieving in chapter 6? That's the question. It's certainly not... Uh, well, uh, I, I'm hoping to get to that. It can't... Look, are we looking at goats or, or sheep? His people can be the unbelieving in this context, folks. That's what I'm going to suggest. This is not about redemption, but the ministry of reconciliation, what we're teaching, the ones we, we cannot yoke with, that is work or fellowship with within this ministry of reconciliation, are those who God calls the unbelieving, okay, that is, those who, although they are His, they are not, they're not goats. They receive the grace of God in vain, verse 1 of chapter 6. And God is writing this, not to the Ephesians, but to the most carnal church enumerated in the New Testament. What amazing grace. And now, compare this to how mainstream Christianity interprets 
do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The ones we cannot yoke with, that is work or fellowship with, within this ministry of reconciliation are those who God calls the unbelieving. Those who, although they are His, they are not, they're not goats, okay? They receive the grace of God in vain. This is what I believe the text is showing us. The call is not to be working along uh, with them in their cause. Some of us cannot yoke together with this other gospel that's preached today. You know, I have friends who, who cannot, uh, even left the church that they were attending. Uh, they weren't comfortable. They didn't feel fed. They walked out more hungry than ever. Those who received God's grace in vain. Where you, where you plowed differently. You know, who despised the light? Who, who, who were unbelieving, untrusting when it came to the ministry of reconciliation? Goats? I don't, I don't think that's what we're looking at. The good news of what God had done and you came out from among them and you became separate and God received you as sons and daughters. You could not work together. It's not saying separate from your, your alcoholic grandfather, you know, or who hides his whiskey bottle or to not have to do with sinners. Jesus had to do with sinners or not, not to have to do with goats or even, even a, a non-Christian spouse. Folks, the context is ministry declaring what God has done. They were not declaring what God had done, but what man must do. Be ye not yoked together with them, unbelievers in the body of Christ, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness. You don't think there's unrighteousness and darkness in the body of Christ? And what harmony, concord, the words harmony, hath Christ with Belial, that's, that's the name for Satan, or what part does he that believe have with an infidel, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It's not so saying throw away your, your unbelieving, unfaithful brethren. It's saying you cannot work together for the same cause. That is, that is look, uh, that is not the picture You'd have to go out of the world, folks. Context. That's the picture. Now, one of them, either the ox or, or, or the ass, represents one who has received the grace of God in vain. I don't know which one that'd be. I would expect it's probably the donkey. But you can't plow together. Different ministries. One says it's about what Christ did. The other says, well, no, it's, 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 all, it's all about what man must do. And both are redeemed, but both can't plow together. They, you can't mix law with grace. And God says this to the most carnal Christians on the planet. He calls them righteous. He calls them light. The question has always been, who are the unbelievers here in this context? I believe it is the unfaithful Christians doesn't mean that we delete unbelieving grandpa from our contact list. It does mean that we can't work together with grandpa in, the, in, the minister, in this ministry of reconciliation. It's not saying we ought to have nothing to do with sinners. Jesus ate with sinners. God does not want his people furthering Satan's cause. The name Belial, that's an epithet for Satan, Christ is not in harmony with Satan. Why should we be? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. That is, feel at home is the Greek word there. 
He feels at home and, and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Folks, God feels at home in this ministry of reconciliation. It's the only ministry that we have. And that's where he walks. Law doesn't welcome him. Now, what he told the children of Israel was that they should, should not yoke an ox and a donkey together. And I have heard all kinds of sermons and preachings and, and I've read articles about, you know, why that this is such a bad deal. You know, even some from, from my rancher friends. I mean, you know, one gores and kicks and, or, you know, they don't pull together. They walk. They got a different gait. You know, all of those things may be true, but they have no bearing at all on why God commanded it. God commanded that when you had the oxen, you were working in the field, you shouldn't muzzle him so that the ox could eat grain. Now, did he do that because, because, well, he likes oxen. I'm sure he likes oxen, but I don't think that's why he did that. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that God hates the ox. What he says is the ox was no consideration at all in the passing of that law. The reason God passed that law was to teach you that the workman was worthy of his hire. It was not his concern for the ox. Now, in our generation of, of concern for the environment and, and animals and, and everything else, you know, I, I swear to miss turtles when I'm driving. We just, we just love a verse where you allow the ox to eat the grain. You know, the workman is worthy of his hire. Why did he command that? You shouldn't put an ox in the same yoke because they kick and gore and don't walk at the same gait? Fooey. I don't believe that. The only reason in the world that he passed that law was to teach you that you don't yoke together an unclean animal, the ox, or a clean animal, the, the ox, and an unclean animal, the ass. That's the only reason that he passed the law. Not because of variances in the animal or, or the difficulty that you might have in, in plowing, but to teach you that you do not couple together in the, in the same yoke, or you don't, you don't couple the two yokes together of both clean and unclean. What's clean and unclean? That's what he says here. Don't take your yoke, which is clean, and tie it to a yoke which is unclean. Don't lose sight of our central theme, the ministry of reconciliation. God says, no, there's absolutely no synergism. There is no possibility of peaceful coexistence. And he now gives us five illustrations. Five illustrations. For what partnership can there be between righteousness and lawlessness? We are not contrasting the converted and unconverted here. Now, the word lawlessness there is an interesting word because in John, we are told that sin is the transgression of the law. If you have the authorized version, sin is lawlessness. You know, we tend to make sin an action. You know, you go rob a bank, you know, it's, you committed a sin. I suppose as a, as a minister, the question that's most commonly asked me is, is it a sin to smoke? Is it a sin to dance? You know, that, that, that's, that thought is contrary, folks, to the thought of Scripture. That's, again, the pagan idea. If I do all of these things that please the gods, then the gods will bless me. You know, sin is an attitude. Sin is in the heart. The supreme scriptural expression of sin is lawlessness, and the opposite of lawlessness is righteousness. And one strives in vain for any synergism on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, with the, the scribes and the Pharisees, he wasn't even polite. He used very strong language because he stood for the truth. He called people hypocrites. He called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. He called them of their father the devil. 
There could be no possible agreement between the righteousness represented by the Lord Jesus Christ and the lawlessness represented by the Pharisees. They were the separatists of the day. That's, that's what the word means. The Pharisee, that's what the word Pharisee means. They were totally dedicated to the law. You wanted any legal precedent handed down or any decision read, you know, you went to the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the defenders of the Word of God, and Christ called them hypocrites. He called them sons of the devil. He called them murderers. I believe that these first two speak of the great personality of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the, that personality that He imputed to us, that righteousness that He imputed to us that we don't earn, and that the prime concentration is on Christ. I don't think it's saying what fellowship has, has, have the, has the sheep's righteous acts with the unrighteous acts of a goat. I don't think that's what it's saying. That's not what I don't... It, I, I don't think that's what it says. I believe it's talking about the infinite, all-encompassing righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ contrasted with a lawless, unrighteous, attitude, fleshly, carnal, law-keeping mindset. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? And now what communion, what, what inner fellowship can light have with darkness? You can't tell me there's no darkness in the body of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. We are told that we are light bearers, you know, for we manifest the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in John that God is light and in Him is no darkness whatsoever. Doesn't mean there's no darkness in the, in the church. God is totally separate from the concept of darkness. What possible inner communion or fellowship can there be between light and darkness? Once again, speaking of the essential characteristics of Christ and Satan. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit goes on and emphasizes that with the end of verse 15. Moreover, what symphony, that's a musical term, what concord, what symphony has Christ with Satan? And, and as I mentioned, Belial is the Hebrew expression for Satan. What concord, what symphony, what music could be made together between Christ and the devil? We don't find any tactfulness on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ when He was tempted in the wilderness. The only indication that we ever have in, in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ is comments about Satan uh, as far as his comments about Satan, is that he's a liar. He's a murderer. And that from the beginning. He rebukes him. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. There isn't a possible indication any place that Christ ever does any reaching out towards Satan. Not one single effort to work together in any way. So I'm going to suggest, as, as unpopular as it may seem, I think I have been here by suggesting that these final verses of the sixth chapter are not, they are not contrasting children of God with children of the devil. That's the popular view. You're welcome to it. I can't do that. We are looking at a church context in a ministry context. And though there is obviously tear among the wheat, the term believer is a term of endearment like doubting Thomas. Thomas was redeemed, but he, he didn't believe. He doubted. He, he was unfaithful. And there are many Christians who do not, do not believe. Many are not persuaded by God concerning the truth of this book. They're not persuaded by God concerning the truth of the ministry of reconciliation. The word unbeliever is the negative of the word faith. Uh, faith is pastuo. This is apostuo. It's be ye not unequally yoked, that is, working together for a common cause, together with these unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Unrighteousness is a, is a term that is not strictly limited to non-Christians. 
the, the Greek word. Although all born-again Christians are righteous in Christ, and that I mean all, all unbelief is sin, which is the opposite of righteousness. What communion hath light with darkness? Again, it would be incorrect to assume that no believer walks in darkness. We just can't, you can, I can't do that with the text. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Just as there is no harmony between Christ and Satan, there is no harmony between the faithful and the unfaithful. There's just friction. The unbelieving with the unbelieving. What part has he that believeth with an infidel? The word infidel is unbelieving. Verse 15, what portion does the one who believes have with the infidel? The word infidel is the word apostuo. Uh, the negative of the word faith, faithless, uh, not faithful. Verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Not all at Corinth believed what God said. Yet nevertheless, they are the temple of God. They are His people. Christians are often involved in idolatrous worship just as God's redeemed people Israel in the wilderness. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. It's a, I see the Lord's loving arms of embrace uh, reaching out to them. It's not saying that God, God does not dwell at home. He's not at home is the Greek word. In the, he doesn't feel at home. He doesn't walk among those who are unbelieving. That doesn't mean He's not their God. doesn't mean He's... or anything like that. But there's no fellowship in, in doubt and all of that junk. I believe that the verse is speaking of God's faithfulness toward His people. Whether they're trusting Him in faith or whether they're not. And we come to verse 17. You know, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We're looking at communion, fellowship, ministry, work, labor. We're not, we're not looking at, at a distinction between the unredeemed and the redeemed here, in my opinion. The word separate there means to make a boundary. I do not believe that we are being asked to separate ourselves from goats, okay? You know, just because we're sheep. You know, we, well, we kind of have to leave the planet to do that. What, what confuses me, what astounds me, is how that modern evangelism insists, on the one hand, that we are to have nothing to do with, with you know, this guy over here involved in sin, and, you know, that is, or goats, you know, when its entire mission is to turn goats into sheep. Scripture tells me that a goat will never hear his voice. The Word of God also declares that there will be those who are his who will not be persuaded when it comes to some aspect of doctrinal truth. That includes me. That includes you. Touch nothing unclean and I will receive you. That, that ministry of that, that they have is not a clean ministry. We are to have mercy on those who are doubting, like Thomas and others, saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by, by the flesh. We do not, nor can we ever, pull a goat out of the fire, but we can hate the righteous garment that they wear that's been polluted, corrupted, spotted by the flesh. And I will receive you to receive, welcome, in a personal, heartfelt way. Literally, it means receive into, deeply receive. Uh, it's, it's only used in here in this passage. It's used nowhere else. If this were speaking of goats or tear, God would hereby be commanding goats to come out uh, or sheep to come out and be separate 
uh, from or, or goats to, to come out and be separate from other goats, which makes no sense. You know, or uh, verse 18, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Pastor sure sounds to me like he's talking about the unredeemed. I don't think that at all. I don't think for a moment that the Holy Spirit is speaking of those who are not his becoming his sons and daughters. He just, you know, it's not, it's not what it's saying. But that such ones will realize in their experience that they are in fact his sons and daughters. Which often becomes questionable in the lives of those who are unbelieving. Dearly beloved, I don't believe that there's any possibility in the last portion of the 15th verse to say that, that this infidel, this unbeliever, could ever become a, a believer because he already is one. He may in fact believe the preaching of the cross of Christ is foolish, you once did, so did I, Paul did, just like Paul before his conversion on the road to Damascus, though Paul was always a child of God. Paul became one of God's children on the road to Damascus? Are you kidding me? Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He, he believed in Jehovah. He believed the Word. I think if Paul had died when he was 12 years old, you'd see him in heaven. He didn't have to go through the Damascus experience to get to heaven. He went to heaven because Christ died in his place. He went through the Damascus experience to find out that he was reconciled. He didn't know it before. He didn't know that before. Now he, he knows it. Here, this infidel, this unbeliever, is one who belongs to God, I believe, and there could be nothing in common between one believing God and one who is not when it comes to this ministry of reconciliation. Only friction. Disharmony. The Scriptures tell us in the Old Testament, that even the plowing of the unrighteousness is sin. And the worship of the unrighteous is idolatry, which is an abomination to God. God knew that I wasn't perfect when He chose me. I know in, in my own personal life, my greatest longing is to live totally surrendered and yielded to God and I, and I know, but I also know I'm so far from that that it staggers my imagination. But God didn't tell me here that it, 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 I'd become a, a member of His body, the temple, if I did something. You know, if I became uh, something. It, it was because if I became anything, it was because God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. It was something God has already done. God dwelt within me long before I knew it. He dwelt within Paul long before Paul knew it. The Holy Spirit tells us that Paul was separated from his mother's womb. And because we have these promises, because God said this, you know, a promise, you know, in our language is a potential. A promise in God's language is a fact then let us separate ourselves from every defilement of the flesh and the Spirit. And I believe that is a strong exhortation to the Christian. That takes us to chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, us, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Us. The context is Christians. I've said this before. I, I do not believe that uh, Scripture has much to say to the non-believer except for judgment. I do believe that, that most of all, more than, more than, in, than 
you tend to think we're always looking at, in the New Testament, a church context. And I just see these as it's not contrasting the converted with the unconverted or the it's not necessarily contrasting you know Christians and non-Christians those who are born again those who are not born again those who are children of the of God and those who are children of the devil that is not the contrast that's being drawn here in these final verses of the 6th chapter I don't see that now if you do that's fine but I don't see that so here's the question. In your opinion, is this passage contrasting sheep and goats, wheat and tare, children of God versus children of the devil? And is that not the common accepted view? Does it not read like that? Like, like that's the case. It does appear to contrast the redeemed and unredeemed, does it not? I mean, I confess, I, do, I, I don't see that. I just don't. I think every statement is contrasting believing and unbelieving Christians, those who received God's grace in vain and those who did not. I think many of us have a hard time with the redeemed but not delivered aspect. But the truth is God, God is interested in the matter of salvation in the lives of His redeemed people. Deliverance is a process as well as a future event. It's ongoing deliverance for us here. Salvation, rescue, it's ongoing. It is the righteousness based on faith initially and continually. We can believe God or we can not. Without that, relationship, communion, prayer, study, everything, including growth, basically becomes irrelevant and we have no one to minister to. You know, we're just all evangelists. Don't need to really study. We're just sort of all in a fixed state of maturity. Neither growth uh, uh, or maturity are relevant. Goats, I, I don't see them anywhere in the picture here. That's, that's how I got to run with it. You make them goats and it makes no sense. Amazing thing is, is if it is goats, that is, you know, then modern evangelism, the modern evangelistic movement has a lot of explaining to do. That is the mainstream thought, but it sounds like law to me. Meanwhile, the real message that the Holy Spirit intended to convey goes unheard. And so I have to suggest this is about the church not saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and so on. Knowing that God did this for this carnal group of Christians and who they were in Him, it just fills my heart with joy. I know that He feels the same about us as He does the Corinthians. His heart was opened wide to them. It's opened wide to us. We just tend to wonder those who have come to realize that we are delivered by grace, we're redeemed by grace, we're saved by grace, that He loves us, that He's always with us. He never does anything, brings anything into our lives except it's for our ultimate good. He has our lives, the course of our lives that has been planned out. He's promised that it, what He's began, He'll finish. So many wonderful truths that I've, I've mentioned before. It's through these great and precious promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. I see that, how that fits very well into this picture here. Two classifications, two groups of believers there at Corinth, those who, who had come to realize the truth of the ministry of reconciliation, those who had not, who had not, and heart, God's heart goes out to these individuals to, uh, to give them every, everything that they need to know to understand uh, just what it means to, to walk in fellowship and in communion with Him. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you all for staying with us through this study in Corinthians. Uh, pray for us in the direction of this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.